Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Orlando Feima. I'm a partner with TPA. And today we have the honor to host the webinar with Novo Graaf, who will present how to maximize the value of IP. And to me, IP rights always were a complex uh, topic. And Novo Graaf is a company that actually combines different services to increase your competitive advantage and optimize the business impact of your IP assets. And Novogav is doing that by combining legal, administrative, and commercial services. And from our perspective, Novogav is a company that has an enormous international and detailed experience in how to best manage IP. Before I give the word to Monique, I would like to um, make one or two remarks regarding these difficult uh, corona times for everyone. And um, you can imagine that when we speak about corona, it's not only about health, but also about transfer pricing. And we see in our network and our customers and clients that most companies are affected and see deteriorating results. Of course, some have better results depending on the business they are in. But in any case, it's very important before the end of the year to contact TPA as your advisor to look into your transfer pricing structure and documentation and review with us whether you can current whether your current setup is optimized given the current economic changes in 2020 um, because if you do it well it can save you significant uh, taxes in, in in different countries we can only advise you to contact your TPA partner to review together with us your setup and make changes in the TP documentation or structure or even structure where necessary. So I would like now to give the word to, to Monique. Um, before I do that, I have one administrative point that I would like to raise that if you have questions, and I can imagine you have questions on this, uh, um, topic please type those in so that rosanna can make, basically make sure that monique um, and her colleagues can answer those questions after her presentation so there is a box on the right of your screen where you can type in the questions but having said that i would like to give the word to to monique yes thank you orlando for the kind introduction um, my name is uh, Monique Grandeman. I am here with my uh, colleague Frank Enghardt and uh, I will let him introduce himself first and then I will say something about myself and then uh, I'll start with the presentation. Frank? Good afternoon, my name is uh, Frank Enghardt and I'm um, uh, bringing about uh, 30 years of experience in, in IP to the table to uh, assist uh, Monique at the end of her presentation. Uh, with with any questions that uh, that uh, that may arise and uh, to which we're uh, looking forward, Monique. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Uh, well, I've been working in the IP industry for over 24 years now. Uh, I started out at a small IP firm, uh, also here in Amsterdam, for five years, and then for 19 years now, I'm already working at uh, at Novagraaf. Uh, my client portfolio is mainly uh, consisting of uh, corporate uh, corporate clients, so the larger IP portfolios, but of course here at Novagraaf we also uh, service uh, all other kinds of uh, smaller or larger companies. Now there's a, a whole lot to tell you on the subject of uh, maximizing the value of your RP and there's limited time, so I will get started. Um, I expect the audience to be mainly financial professionals, so we will try to make it interesting also for you, of course. Uh, the story is uh, quite substantial. Uh, I will start with some sheets uh, to outline the context of IP. Uh, I will try to go through those quickly in order to come to the main subject, uh, how to maximize the value of your IP. We will send you the sheets afterwards, so you can reread all the information at your own convenience later on as well. And as Orlando already said, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box so we can uh, uh, answer them uh, at the end of the pre presentation. Uh, why is this not working? Um, 
But first, let me start with a short introduction of our company. Uh, some facts. We have been existing for over 130 years, uh, starting out as a, as a company called Van de Graaf. Then we were named Mark Graaf for many years. And over uh, 20 years ago, we've yeah. been called Nova Graaf. We have companies in, um, we have 17 offices worldwide in, in some countries, uh, and we're the leading TM representative in the European Union. Um, the presentation that I will give today will concern all kinds of IP, which is very broad. And the core business uh, of our company here in Amsterdam is trademarks. Therefore, the focus of my presentation will be also on trademarks. Um, on this sheet, you can see where our 17 offices are seated. Uh, we are specialized in worldwide IP portfolio management. So it is also the angle of today's presentation. Of course, the value of IP can increase with good marketing or brand management. But today we talk about the IP point of view. We are a full service company and we are, as Orlando already explained, combining legal advice and procedures with also our innovative tools. So we're also uh, an IP tech company. Um, and as said, of course, the sheets will be sent uh, for your rereading afterwards. So I won't go into the details of this sheet right now. Now, as said, we will focus on trademarks today. Um, and I will try to give you a really short introduction of trademarks, uh, especially for the participants who have never worked with IP. Um, so mainly we will tell you something about what are trademarks. Now, trademarks uh, have different functions. Uh, the main function is the, the origin function. Uh, that is the most important. So uh, the consumer can tell where the trademark comes from and the products and the services, of course, that uh, belong under the trademark. But of course, also the investment and the goodwill function is of great importance. Now, with a well protected and registered trademark, you can protect your company from infringers and counterfeiters. And that's, of course, the legal point of view. Um, yeah, with a trademark, you gain an exclusive right once registered and it's absolute and subjective. These are some examples of different kinds of marks. We have uh, marks for goods. Uh, so in the example, for example, for beer, but it can be for cars, bicycles, uh, cigarettes, or whatever, clothing, uh, all kinds of goods. Uh, of course, marks for services, financial services, for example. Um, and there's a difference also between individual mark and certification or collective marks. Now, certification and collective marks um, might not be of much interest for this, uh, for this presentation, so we will stick to the individual marks. Other types of trademarks, other, other ways to divide uh, and distinguish trademarks are uh, the word marks, word device marks, where a logo is added to the word mark, such as in the left at the Coca-Cola logo, uh, but also device marks separately, as in the Nike swoosh that you see here, and which is very recognizable. And also packaging layouts can be subject of a trademark. Then there are the differences between 3D marks, uh, slogans, color marks, sound marks, hologram marks, and even multimedia marks, which can be a little video with sound and, and everything. Uh, for example, our own multimedia mark. Um, now I can fill in the whole presentation with telling you about trademarks, but let's just go to the main subject. Now, why is IP relevant for financial professionals? Let's start with some trends. Uh, globalization of IP follows the economic globalization. And IP teams face an increasing complexity in legal and managerial tasks. And also IP departments are under pressure to control budgets and improve operations and technology. 
IPA used to be mainly a subject for legal and marketing professionals. However, the subject is increasingly a finance and value story. IP is actually one of the largest components on the balance sheet of a company with an asset value of more than 84%. As you can see here on, on the sheets as well. However, from the time spent on an IP portfolio, only 9.5% of that time is spent on creating actual value, value and monetizing of the trademarks. There are some good examples of companies that do understand how to earn money with IP. And for example, that is Philips and Nokia, uh, both company who successfully licensed their IP, making that even their core business. It is to say that they even make more money of their licenses than of their core products. So that is a very interesting fact. Now, how and when are you as a finance professional involved in IP? Well, there is, of course, the cash and value side. Yeah, that is mainly in two ways. Now, for the cash side, you can think of, of course, the money to be spent uh, on, on trademarks and, of course, the budgeting uh, there too. And on the value side, you can think of uh, merger and acquisition, for an example. Now, in an M&A, of course, you can buy a company that has IP in it, in which IP has a certain amount of value, which is to be uh, taken into account. And also, um, it is very important to know what are you buying? How do you know if the IP is sustainable? There are important qu questions to be asked, and I will try to help you answer those later on in the presentation. But uh, the main questions are to start with, uh, is the IP properly registered and protected? Um, and is the assignment of the IP assured in the acquisition? So to say if the IP is coming with the company that you buy or not. How do I make sure I own the relevant IP? First, let's have a look at the IP cycle. Of course, it starts with development of, uh, of IP, but also developing the IP protection strategy. So there's much to be done also in these steps, which you can see on the sheet. I will not read them out loud, uh, of course, all. But already in the development phase, you see a few very important points. Now, in the steps to follow, you have the preparation, of course. You can start with availability searches, infringement searches, due diligence, uh, and all kinds of steps preparing before you start registering to trademark. Then, of course, the registering itself, uh, which can be done in uh, almost every country in the world, if available, of course. Uh, then there is the enforcement step, which is very important to uh, make sure that you maintain your rights also uh, against third parties. Um, tools to, to help you there with our uh, trademark and domain name watching, of course, um, and all kinds of procedures to start against third parties that might infringe your IP rights. Then there's, of course, the maintenance, uh, mainly, of course, the renewals. Every 10 year, a trademark needs to be renewed, um, but also portfolio rationalization, um, all subjects I will get back to uh, later on in the presentation as well. And then there is, of course, the monetizing, uh, very important subjects here in this presentation. Uh, it can be a portfolio acquisition, uh, brand valuations of which we uh, work together with uh, TPA, uh, licensing and due diligence, of course. And all these steps together in the IP uh, cycle um, are important for the trademark strategy. Now let's dive a little deeper in some of the relevant subjects. One of the main subjects in the IP cycle is registration. If a trademark is not registered, you don't own a trademark right. 
that is the ground rule. There are some exceptions in some common law countries, such as the USA. From a legal point of view, uh, you might gain some rights by using the trademarks in that country. But those rights are limited and not so broad as you would have uh, with a trademark registration. And also in those countries, and that is to say in all countries, in order to create value, registration is key. Now, when you want to register a trademark, we take into account what we call the four W's. The who, what, where, and what for. Now, the who is to say, on which company name are we going to register the trademark's rights? That is the first step that you have to decide on. What are you going to register? Are you going to register only the word mark or also the device or also the word device mark? And will you do it in color or in black and white? All kinds of questions uh, about the type of trademark uh, to be asked for registration. Then, of course, the where, in which countries. Most important is to you to register the countries, of course, in the countries uh, of the to register a trademark, of course, in the countries where you use the trademark or where you produce the trademark. For example, if you have if you sell shoes and you have the shoes made in China, then it's also important to register the trademark in China, even though you might not sell the shoes in China. All kinds of things to be taken into account in a trademark registration strategy. And also, of course, the what for. What goods, what services will you be using the trademark for? In m and it is essential to have an external trademark attorney perform a due diligence search to determine what exactly it is that you buy. Is there a trademark portfolio? Is it well taken care of? Are there gaps in the portfolio? Maybe countries where the trademark is not registered where it should be, or maybe new goods and services for which the older trademarks are not registered. And also very important, are there trademarks under legal procedure? Because you can get some not so nice surprises if you buy a trademark and it's under a procedure in key countries. So make sure you actually report the assignment of the trademark, the recordal of assignments uh, from the one company to the next one of the IP rights uh, in all the relevant registers. Another question is, how do I maintain my rights on IP? Um, of course, trademarks are registered in most countries for 10 years, and every 10 years you need to renew the trademark if it is still um, relevant for you in that country. And also to maintain your rights, enforcement is very important, also to prevent dilution of your trademark rights. Now, once you know what IP you own, and in order to make sure you have a good grip on the IP portfolio, you need to develop an IP strategy with your external or internal trademark attorney. In global IP management, there are eight key questions. There's the question on the management. How efficient uh, and effective are you? Um, but also who is managing, who, which people in the company are uh, responsible for managing the trademark portfolio. Uh, in creation, do you also know what rights you own, create and use? What measures have you taken to protect your IP? And how can you improve the exploitation of your IP rights, which is very important in the exploitation part? Then there's the enforcement. Do you know what your competitor is doing uh, with your IP? And do you have the licenses you are entitled to? And then in the middle, what is your IP strategy and how valuable is IP to your company? Also in the IP circle, there are many questions to be answered. The part of the creation, protection and enforcement can be put under a legal uh, 
question, but the exportation is mainly about the value. Does the company know the costs, benefits and return on investments of its IP, for example? Now, these questions are here on the right below under exploitation. Now, of course, when you have to register, renew and enforce your trademark, that costs money. But a trademark can also generate money. There are three main ways how to generate money from your trademarks. First, there is the licensing. You can give out licenses to your trademarks and, of course, earn money with that. The second, which is increasingly becoming more uh, popular, uh, also uh, during uh, crisis times uh, such as now, is pledging. You can go to the bank and get a loan based on the value of your IP. It will be recorded with your trademark registrations in the registers and um, that will be the funding for the, for the bank to, get, to give you a loan if necessary. And also, of course, if your trademarks uh, if you have always invested good in your trademarks and there's goodwill, then of course it has a lot of value when you sell either the whole company or just one or two of your trademarks or other IP rights. Now, don't forget to take these three uh, money generators up in your overall IP strategy. Another part of the strategy in an IP portfolio is, of course, budgeting. At Novagraaf, we timely provide input on the budgets of our clients. We therefore use our innovative tools, such as in Easy IP. Also, in the end of the presentation, I will give you an overview of some reports that we can give that can be used also for budgeting. Renewals are usually a large, large portion of the budget. Trademarks need to be renewed uh, every 10 years, so it is very foreseeable. Of course, there's also parts in the budget for uh, possible new registrations, for enforcement, for watching, and all kinds of uh, other things that we can take up in account. But some, um, some parts of the budgets are very foreseeable, and we always give you those, uh, this information in advance. In budgeting and also deciding on renewals, uh, there is also a chance for savings. Now, in these sheets, I will provide you with some tips for those savings. Um, for example, when you have a good organized portfolio, it is much easier to oversee costs and easier to prevent um, costs that are not um, necessary to make. Also, if you are dealing with a budget reduction, there can also be a chance in the budget for your IP to call the so-called dead wood. If you don't use the trademark anymore in, a, in several kinds of countries, then you don't have to renew it there uh, again. And lastly, also drawing up a list of marks which are potentially vulnerable to non-use. Uh, cancellation is usually very helpful in deciding where to renew. Now, your external trademark attorney can help you with tips on how to save costs on your renewals. And actually, a good trademark attorney will advise you proactively on that. Now, one step again in the, in the first part, in the organizing of the portfolio, centralization of all the IP rights in one company with, uh, with one or two people dealing with that. Uh, and also centralization of ownership. Uh, those will always uh, make sure that the portfolio is better organized and will prevent double costs. Also, costs can easily be saved on enforcement without losing IP rights or decreasing the value. It's good to confine offensive action only to the core brands and territories if the budget is low. It is also possible to settle uh, contentious actions if possible, uh, for example, with a demarcation agreement. 
it will save costs on expensive procedures uh, if that can be prevented. And also use the automated technology to manage online brand protection. Also in the end of the presentation, I will have a sheet on our new innovative online brand protection tool. This tool also features automated enforcement. Now, very important in making decisions on your IP portfolio and your budgets are the risks. Risks can be also assessed by your external trademark attorney. You should always ask for advice before deciding to assess all the risks. Of course, when budgets are low, you can decide to abandon a trademark, but it can be very expensive to have to re-register again in two or three years when things go better. Also, not involving the brand manager in the decision making um, is a big risk. Monique. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? This is Dave uh, speaking. Um, I, I would like to ask a question. Do you see a lot of uh, transfers of uh, brands um, which have to do with the specific situations around COVID-19 and, and how would that, that process you were just describing work out in that case? Uh, well, we see a different approach in, in portfolio management, uh, especially at the companies that uh, are going through uh, very heavy weather with the uh, corona crisis. Uh, they will have lower budgets, so we, have, we always advise them, uh, especially about these risks. Um, but of course, also, we try to, uh, to advise them in um, how to, uh, to be able to lower the budget, uh, have spend less on IP, but still have uh, the trademark portfolio um, as good as it should be. We don't see a lot of uh, assignments, if that is, is, is the recorders of assignment, if that is what you mean. Um, yeah, what, what we see is that, that some companies are uh, stopping for now with new projects that were started up uh, before the crisis, but uh, they, they've put, been put on hold. But other companies all also see this, uh, this period as a chance to be innovative and they start new projects. And of course, for those new projects, also the IP uh, needs to be protected. So they, they, even though they are tight on budget, they will spend uh, some of it on, on IP protection to make sure that those new innovative uh, ideas are well protected uh, as well. Well, at least the trademarks, uh, I mean, um, of course. Um, Frank, do you have some input? Uh, yeah, well, what, what you what you do see is that uh, that there is an in, increased uh, awareness um, uh, to at least a certain extent uh, with uh, with financial uh, uh, providers to uh, to make uh, to make sure that uh, that IP is used as uh, as collateral, and and we do see a slight increase in in requests for registration of, uh, of, of pledges with, uh, with trademark uh, registrations. Um, and that, that underlines that, um, that a, an IP right is, is, is a financial asset and, and can be used as, uh, as such. Yeah, I must say must, one of my larger clients is, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a large bank. And for this bank, we also do the recordal of the pledges and we see um, a lot more of those uh, coming by, as Frank says. Yeah, so we do a lot more pledging. Um, and that, that's, of course, an increase that you see in a, in a crisis uh, like this. Does this uh, answer your question, Steve? Uh, yes, Monique. Uh, the, the the question was indeed on on assignments, but uh, certainly also that pledge um, uh, that pledge situation is uh, is very interesting. Uh, the assignment you would expect if if brands uh, in the apparel industry, for example, if uh, retail goes very very bad, very sour, then then obviously brands are um, maybe reassigned to other group companies. 
uh, or other parties. Uh, but certainly, in uh, if, if you if you move, as you said, uh, innovative concepts. If you move a retail store to an experience store, which is now also happening in the apparel industry, I can imagine some of these concepts you're you're trying out in the in the uh, retail store uh, new concepts you would like to protect as well especially if it's trade trade uh, mark related so thanks yeah okay it is true that uh crisis also makes uh, people inventive and uh, if that uh, creates uh, new inventive steps uh then you should always look uh, at whether or not it's also an, an IP right that, that should be protected as such. Okay, we're already coming to the conclusion. So my conclusion is IP strategy is key. Now, first you start with getting your IP in order and have everything registered and protected. Then you also look into an efficient management and to reduce possible, possibly the costs of the portfolio um, and see chances therein uh, as well. And then you can also, of course, explore the possibilities of getting actual value in the IP by licensing, pledging or selling the IP. So strategy uh, is key in this. Um, Now, there are various reports and insights that can help you in making the right strategic decisions regarding your IP. Now, this is how we can help by providing reports uh, so that you can, uh, so can, you can make the right choices in your portfolio in any kind of circumstances. If there's a crisis or if it's going very well, uh, there's always uh, uh, choices to make on your IP portfolio. So if you have any questions or uh, want to know on how we do things at Novagraaf, you can, of course, always contact me or my colleague Frank. Um, and then if uh, then we can provide you with uh, these kinds of reports where, where necessary. And again, for IP valuation, we, of course, work together with uh, TPA Global. Now, as promised, I will show you just a little bit about our uh, innovative tools. Uh, this uh, is EasyIP. Uh, it's our online client portal. Uh, it's under constant further development and it's, uh, it's a very useful and um, uh, handy uh, tool. Uh, it will provide you with dashboard, dashboards on the full portfolio. Uh, there's a renewal uh, uh, module in it where you can see uh, which uh, trademarks, of course, need to be renewed, uh, what it costs, and of course, when uh, when it needs to be renewed, so you can make overviews and reports for yourself. Also on the watching, and there's uh, direct and easy communication uh, through the portal. And last but not least, our new online brand protection um, enforcement solution, which is very cost effective due to the automated enforcement, which is a really new technology and we're very proud of it and if anyone would like to ask some questions about these tools or of course all the other subjects that were in the presentation please don't hesitate to ask them now or contact us later so then now we can start uh, with the questions uh, if any um there doesn't seem to be any questions no one um submitted them maybe the audience would like to now give some questions to monique with which i can invite to her i received a question from mel uh, rosanna and mm -hmm. um, um there are two w's monique that you referred to it's the what and uh, and where and especially in difficult during difficult corona times question is is it better in order to decrease the cost of registration especially for patents to go for eu registration or better to go for key country registrations is there a an advice that you can give there is there a rule of thumb how to cope with that uh, well um if we stick to the to the trademark subjects um 
it is also it's always possible to uh, to register an EU trademark. It's more cost efficient because you can have the 28 countries all in one for a, for a very uh, limited price. So that is a, also a, uh, always a good idea to have an EU registration. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it could be a problem um, because it's one registration for all these countries. So if there's a problem in one of those countries, for example, let's say if a Polish company has a trademark uh, that has a prior right, uh, that can be a problem for the registration of your trademark, then, um, then this problem in one country uh, will make that the whole registration will not be registered. Then, of course, it is possible to convert to national registrations in all the other countries, but that will be more costly. So it always depends on uh, did you do the right searches in advance, so you know if the trademark is available in all the countries where you want to register. And sometimes it can be more opportune to register only in the key countries where you are sure that you are going to register. And Frank wants to add something here? Well, especially with, uh, so, th so this goes for trademarks and especially with, with patents, you have to be a little bit more, more careful because uh, for uh, filing patents, you, you really need to to have a, a rather um, steep uh, budget in in for many jurisdictions, um, and that could cause that you would think, okay, I'm I'm only going to file in in one or two countries. But uh, you have to be careful with with uh, a a policy like that because. Um, one of the prerequisites for a patent is that it is new, uh, which means that if you file a patent in, in only in Europe and say Japan, um, and a few years later you want to, to have protection for that patent in uh, say Brazil or, or Canada, it's no longer possible to file a patent. For, for patents and, and for trademarks and designs, you have a uh, so-called uh, Paris Convention priority right, which means that if you file a, a IP right in, in your in one country, you have six months to file in other countries claiming the priority of that original application, which means that um, the, the right that you would obtain in the other country has a, a retroactive effect to the application date in the first country. So. Uh, you, you do not have to immediately decide it, but you have to take that six months into consideration and know that with patents, if you if you do not file uh, in, a, in a country that uh, it's not possible uh, a few years later to as yet obtain protection for that same patent. That's different for trademarks. There you can say, okay, I'm, I'm now using it only in, say, Europe and, and, and North America. I'm going to file this trademark there. And if you then expand your, your portfolio, your, your use of that trademark to, let's say, Australia and New Zealand, it's, it's possible to, do, to and then at that point in time file uh, your IP right there. But there are distinctions so between patents and trademarks and designs. Um, be, be sure that they are not so-called false friends that you think, okay, when it applies to the one, it also applies to the other. Uh, have yourself advised on, on that uh, prior to, to starting a, a application uh, process. That's, I think, very helpful. Uh, thank you, Frank and Monica. Maybe a question, uh, Monique, and, uh, um, on uh, what, what, what industries are asking most for a valuation. So what, what where is the uh, sort of the need for, uh, in, in terms of retail sa uh, sector or certain industries like the apparel, what what is it you see in, in terms of trends? So which, which industries, what, which segments of the market are more in need of valuations? Uh, and are they, second question, are they using that valuation for tax or for commercial reasons? Well, actually, Steve, I do not see a trend in the, in the industry uh, that is asking for valuation. It, in, in my portfolio, it can be very uh, different. It can be the apparel industry, but it can also be uh, uh, the service industry, the, 
financial or 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 security or or uh, any kind of uh, industry. So I don't see a trend on that. Uh, there is indeed the, the different uh, purposes that you would ask it for. It can be a tax reason, but it can also be uh, a legal reason if you have a legal procedure going on. And of course, in an M&A situation. Um, so no, no, I don't see a trend in, in industry on, uh, on valuation. Of course, valuation is also important in, uh, in, in, in licensing. Um, uh, as we said, it's, uh, especially trademarks are, are IP set, uh, assets and they can be sold, they can be pledged, but they can also be licensed. Um, one of the examples of a, a, tra a trademark that's being licensed to, to, to various goods and services uh, is the, the trademark Trump. Um, and uh, there were people who said that, uh, that Donald Trump was actually running for president just to make sure that the value of his trademark Trump would, uh, would, uh, would go up. Now, we, uh, as we all think, uh, lost the election, uh, so uh, I'm not sure whether the valuation of his trademark will go go down or will uh, be more to specific uh, target uh, groups. But um, I can imagine that that if you are in a in a licensing structure with uh, with a trademark like a trademark uh, uh, Trump, uh, that the valuation of that trademark uh, would be uh, would be important. To, to see what the uh, what the underly underlying uh, value um, of the of the license uh, would be. Thanks. Yeah, very uh, very interesting uh, example. Frank, you mentioned uh, licenses for trademarks and for patents. Is there a way to from a register perspective to actually see that a, a patent has been licensed? It's, um, um, I, I have to admit that uh, with respect to, to uh, let's say more the, the, the practical patent aspects, uh, we're not that, we're, we're not patent attorneys here in the, in the Amsterdam office. So actually, uh, Monique and I are, are not really, um, uh situated well to to advise on that but if i if i if i take uh take it to designs and um and and trademarks um it's it's usually you see that a license uh is 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 registered as such and you could then go to to the trademark registry and see whether the trademark is licensed licensed and to whom um the, the registration of, of, of such a license is in, in many cases important in order to give uh, the, not so much the licensor, but the licensee additional rights in, in infringement procedures. But it can also make the, the, the um, uh, let's say the, the, the relationship between a licensor and licensee uh, clear. Now, of course, within uh, a license agreement, you usually have a lot of um, uh, um, segments that you do not want to 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 advertise, like uh, the, the remuneration for the license. So what we usually do is not uh, file the original license agreement to uh, with the, the trademark registry because the trademark registry is a public registry and everyone can inspect it, but rather an excerpt or a declaration that a license uh, agreement uh, exists, and it, that also helps especially if you are um, licensing your trademark for very unrelated goods and services uh, like in the in the example uh, Trump uh, he used it for, for vodka I think for travel for uh, uh, training and education services for stakes the, so these things are very unrelated um, and if you have a registration of your trademark for a lot of unrelated goods and services, it may be important also for the licensor, so the trademark owner, to have licenses registered just to make clear that the trademark is actually being used for those goods or services. Um, because uh, one of the things you have to take into consideration is that when you have registered a trademark and you are not using it for five years or, or longer, someone else can say, okay, I'm going to ask so so-called cancellation of your registration uh, due to non-use. So 
um, but that's also of course an aspect uh, which which with budgeting you have to take into consideration if you file it for a lot of trade uh, a trademark for a lot of classes uh, which means groups of goods and services you could pay additional fees but if you 10 years later uh, see your registration up for renewal you have to really think whether or not your trademark is still being used for all those goods and services for all those classes and also for for those jurisdictions uh, because just renewing, even though you have not been using the trademark, is perhaps not a very good allocation of funds. So we, we, we rather say be careful with with your renewal portfolio and your renewal budgets. Um, we rather spend that budget on filing uh, uh, your actual used trademarks in new jurisdictions where you plan to use it within, let's say, two to three years. Um, and, and allow uh, registrations that are no longer of importance to labs so that you make sure that you, you allocate your budget in a, in a, in a proper way. Thank you, Frank. Rosanna, are there any other questions that came in? No, there doesn't seem to be any uh, new questions coming in. Um, maybe we can wrap up. Yes, thank you, uh, Rosanna. I think this was a very interesting uh, presentation by Frank and Monique about the IP maximization. Um, it's a subject where a lot of experience is uh, needed and we are very pleased that Novo Graaf um, yeah, uh, introduced the subject to, to all of us with this presentation. So afterwards, um, Rosanna will uh, submit to the participants the presentation. And in case there are questions, please contact us or Novo Graaf uh, directly. And on the uh, transfer pricing uh, point that I made during my introduction, please remember that you know before the end of the year, in this very special, difficult year with Corona and lockdowns, uh, it might be really worthwhile to review your TP structure, TP documentation, and look whether you can optimize it and take into account either the deteriorating results for most of the companies and uh, some for some companies also significantly improved uh, results. But also in that case, you need to look whether everything is in place and is documented accordingly to not run into uh, significant uh, tax risk. So please contact TPA, your consultant or partner um, at your um, um, yeah, convenience and um, go with him or her over the TP subject. Then I would like to thank uh, Monique and Frank for the presentation, Rosanna for the organization, and um, all the participants for yeah, attending the presentation. Thank you, and I wish you a very nice evening. Thank you, too. Thanks. Bye-bye.